In the most recent update to my comment policy, I wrote three phrases on the board that have been added to my filtered keywords. These ones. In that video, I said that if you know how these concepts are used in polite conversation, then you know how to refer to them without naming them. A few people have asked me what I meant by that, so I decided to make a quick series where I go through them one at a time. In general, people having a polite academic conversation don't accuse each other of fallacies. One of the most basic tenets of having adult conversations is the assumption of good faith. You assume that the person you're talking to is doing their best to make a fair and correct argument. So if you think they've made a mistake in doing so, you specifically point out the error and ask for a clarification. You should be expecting that they will be able to justify the claim with more detail, or that they will acknowledge the error, remove it from their arguments, and move on. Most of the time this won't do much damage to the overall claim the person is making, because thoughtful people in good faith conversation usually succeed in avoiding errors in the core premises of their claim. If they have incorrect details that don't undermine their actual point, it's nice of you to help them fix that up, but it doesn't mean their argument is bad. First, I should clarify the concept of formal versus informal fallacies. Formal or logical fallacies are structural errors in the mechanics of the argument. So pretty much the most basic structure in formal logic is this. If A, then B. A, therefore B. And here's the best example of this I've ever heard. If A, my car is on fire, then B, my car is not safe to drive. A, my car is on fire, therefore B, my car is not safe to drive. The version that employs a common fallacy is, if my car is on fire, then it is not safe to drive. My car is not safe to drive, therefore it is on fire. This is not the kind of fallacy that gets thrown around on the internet. Instead, what you'll hear online are informal fallacies, which have nothing to do with logic. So pro tip, if somebody tells you you've committed the logical fallacy of an ad hominem attack, they have no clue what they're talking about. Anyone whose knowledge of fallacies goes beyond memorizing lists like their argument cheat codes will know about the fallacy fallacy, if not by name, then by nature. That is, because an argument contains fallacies, formal or informal, does not mean that its conclusion is incorrect. If I told you my car was on fire because it is unsafe to drive, that would be a flawed argument. But saying it wouldn't put my car out. Reminder that the terms discussed in this series are blocked in my comments. I suspect that ad hominem is one of the most misused terms on the anglophone internet. There are two main definitions generally believed by people who use this term unironically. It means calling someone mean names, or it means mentioning the person who makes the argument. First of all, ad hominem is only meaningful in a public debate, by which I mean any argument where two people are ostensibly arguing with each other, but they intend to persuade an audience. Twitter fights are public debate in this context. Ad hominem attacks are when you try to discredit your opponent by appealing to the prejudices of the audience. For example, if a conservative politician calls their opponent a socialist, that's an ad hominem attack. Even if it's true, because the purpose in saying it is to invoke leftover prejudice from the Cold War. This is different from a legitimate attack on the opponent's credibility. Let's say you're arguing with Bob about whether to build a new sports stadium. Bob has a history of lying about the economics of construction projects is not ad hominem. It's a relevant indictment of Bob's credibility. Saying Bob cheats on his wife is an ad hominem attack because it invites the audience to mistrust Bob without establishing how his marital problems affect the credibility of his claims on infrastructure. Reminder that the terms discussed in this series are blocked in my comments. A straw man is when you misrepresent the opposing argument in order to performatively defeat it. In a good faith discussion, you do need to make an effort to engage with the best possible version of the opposing argument. But not every opposing argument is advanced in good faith. Let's take as an example the people who choose to celebrate the losers of the American Slaveholders Treasonous Rebellion of 1861 to 65, usually by waving flags or defending statues. Oh, the purpose of this celebration of anti-American human traffickers is to uphold white supremacist values and promote fear in Americans of color, especially black Americans. The best possible argument these white supremacists will advance for their choice to celebrate the murder of American soldiers in defense of human traffickers is that they're celebrating their cultural identity and heritage, not the politics associated with that identity. But this better argument is not their motivation for celebrating human traffickers. Their motivation is that they're white supremacists. When the opposing argument is itself advanced in bad faith, it's not a straw man argument to go after the indefensible position they actually hold, instead of the much more robust scarecrow they built to distract you. Reminder that the terms discussed in this series are blocked in my comments. Having watched this series so far, you might find yourself wondering, when is the appropriate time to use these words? The answer is when you're teaching somebody about formal and informal fallacies. Being able to name something is a fundamental tool for learning and sharing knowledge about it, and learning how they work will help you avoid doing them and to notice them in media. These are reference words. They create neat packages for conceptual tools that you can unpack to fix an argument. They are not invocations. Just naming a fallacy and expecting it to do your argument for you is like throwing a toolbox at a bathroom sink and expecting it to fix a leaky pipe. Reminder that the terms discussed in this series are blocked in my comments. When you're having conversations with people who literally studied philosophy, you can expect them to be precise with their words. But that's not like normal for humans. We mostly just sort of gesture at ideas and count on other people to make the effort to understand. So last week I used a clip from a TikToker in a video where she said, nothing is being covered by the US media on the topic in question. This wasn't literally true. Some major news organizations had written articles here and there. But it's clear that what she meant was this topic is severely underreported. So to respond to that argument as if what she meant was what she said is an act of bad faith. If you're going to try to have a constructive conversation with someone, your obligation is to meet them where they're at. People misspeak and use idioms and rely on the assumption of good faith to bridge the fact that expressing complicated thoughts by 
encoding them into the sounds we can make with our face meets, or the symbols we invented to represent those sounds, is fucking hard. If you don't confirm that you have the best possible version of someone's argument before trying to refute it, you're not having a constructive conversation, you're being condescending. They aren't going to agree with you when you tear apart the argument they weren't really making, and the only friends you'll make doing that kind of shit suck just as much as you do. Reminder that the terms discussed in this series are blocked in the comments. I've said a couple times this week that in polite debate you have an obligation to assume that everyone participating does so in good faith. A lot of people pointed out that some folks, like white supremacists, can generally be counted on to not do that. These comments made it clear to me that I have failed to write about the actual advice I have for what to do in arguments with known bad faith participants. I started on a separate series on the topic of bad faith, but just to leave you all with an actionable tip, let's say you catch someone cheating at poker. Are you going to try and win honestly anyway? No, you're going to kick their fucking ass and take back what they tried to steal. Bad faith is always corrosive to the systems in which it's expressed. And if you value those systems, you have a moral obligation to not indulge it. If you must engage the person, then don't agree to play within the rules that they're manipulating. And if they're a fascist and the stakes on the table are human rights, you kick their fucking ass and take your society back.